everyone, I'm Marley Dias. As Read Across America Ambassador, I hope to help the National Education Association spark a love of reading among readers of all ages and foster community around diverse books. When we will talk about books together, their understanding of each other grows. That's why I'm excited to make a reading connection today and talk with New York Times bestselling author, Tracy Batiste. How are you? Hi, I'm good. It's so great to see you again. It's good to see you too. I feel like the last time I probably saw you, I, I'm sure I have, but my most vivid memory of meeting you was I had like this big surprise where I got to meet all these authors. It was you, Jackie, Rita, um, and a bunch of other amazing women. And that's like yeah. my, one of my favorite experiences throughout 1000 Black Girl Books. And I, I love the Jumbies and love all their titles. But today we're here to talk about Because Claudette. So the first question for you is, why is sharing Black history, even, you know, very difficult topics with young readers, important? And how do you navigate what might be too, you know, these oppressions, the stories of oppression, stories of racism can often be hard to make accessible and to make seem joyful? Uh, and, and why is it important to still tell those stories? Sure. You know, all history is important for people to know. And for me, even though there are parts of history that are really painful for, for kids to hear, especially really young kids, there is a way to approach that, um, even for very young readers, so that they can understand what's happening. Because young kids really do understand injustice, right? So you can couch things in a way that eliminates some of the more painful aspects of a part of history and talk about the injustice of it and they will understand that. So it really is just a matter of how you approach a topic depending on the age of the reader that you're talking to. And so for me, I think that all of history is important all the time and making sure that kids really understand what that history is but you know, at the emotional level that they are. So younger kids maybe will not get the full story, but it's really important to share with them the truth. I think this element I've met across all the authors that I make reading connections with and get to talk to is this belief and understanding that kids are powerful and that kids really do absorb these stories. And we, that's why we have to take these sort of extra careful considerations. Um, and one of my favorite things to talk about is really this element of emotional truth, like you just said, where, you know, kids are, they might not get the logistics of how did Jim Crow function? How did these systems work? But they see when someone is not being treated fairly and they understand injustice, like you said. They do. So, yeah. So what do you hope that kids can take away from Claudette's story? And also, what do you think that parents can do to make sure that those messages are clear? Sure. I, the thing that I, I, for me, the thing that I was most interested in when I first heard about Claudette Colvin years and years and years ago was just how young she was, right? She was just 15 years old and she did not have a community around her that were um, involved in activism. So what she learned and, and what she was able to do was because of her teacher and her teacher talking to her about people who had done activism in the past. So we're talking about um, Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. And these are things that she learned about at school. And then she took it upon herself to um, put herself in that situation to say what she felt was fair and to do what she did to refuse to give up her seat on the bus because she knew that it wasn't right. And that was the thing that was most um, interesting to me about this particular story, because activism is not something that a one person do a one thing. Activism is built on things that people have been doing historically. And I think that when kids understand that people have been doing this work for a long time, it makes it a lot easier for them to come in and participate. So that's one part. And then the second part that I really wanted um, kids to understand in Because Claudette is that you can have a really small role in something 
and still have it with everybody else's small role make a really big impact. So you don't have to do like a big, bold thing. You don't have to be the person that's on the newspaper or the, you know, on the, the, um, on the nightly news or anything like that. You could do your tiny part and it's still really important. Yeah, I think uh, I feel like my position is someone that has been like an activist and been in this space and has gained a lot of popularity. It's super hard sometimes to make kids understand that this started off as an idea that I was completely failing at. I collected 200 out of a thousand. I had two weeks left that it is really the idea of taking those small steps and just challenging yourself and choosing to be brave when it's hard. That makes those differences. And I'm sure you also understand as an immigrant and someone that moved to the U.S. when you were 15, that taking those big, brave and bold steps, even if it feels like you know, it feels like they might feel like the end of the world, but it's these small moments that are really important. You know, they they do impact other people and they change our lives and our communities for the better. Uh, right. And I think a huge part of building that community is also understanding our history and understanding where we came from. And that's really the goal of this story. So when you were a kid and you didn't have all, you know, access to stories like this, how did where you grew up and, and understandings of what, you know, Trinidad and, Tobago, uh, Trinidad and Tobago's history shaped you as a young girl? Did you have a lot of titles that, you know, talked about who you are that showed you the, that uh, other young women that had come before you or did you learn you know as you got older well the thing about growing up in Trinidad and Tobago in particular is that um, you know I'm growing up in a country where everybody looks like me right so I am half of my family is of African descent the other half of my family is of Indian descent and that is the majority of the population of Trinidad and Tobago. So everybody looked like me, everybody looked like family members of mine. So there wasn't this sense of barrier to me doing literally anything I wanted. The other thing that's particular to Trinidad and Tobago and to a lot of other Caribbean nations is that we are all super, super politically motivated. You will not find any family in any of the islands that doesn't know what's happening in politics, that isn't involved, that isn't excited about voting. So the idea of political activism is just like, you know, brushing your teeth in the morning. It really is very natural, comes very natural to everybody. It's just something that everybody does. So that makes me, I think, a person who is just naturally interested in people who are doing um, political things. I'm very interested in what is happening around me. I'm very interested, especially in my local politics, with like, um, you know, like even with small things like say a school board election or something like that. I'm super interested in that. I'm super interested in what people have to say, what people are going to do. And it makes me really engage. And I think it comes from that background, that um, upbringing that I had in Trinidad where everyone is so politically engaged that I couldn't help but continue to be politically engaged when I moved here when I was 15 years old. I couldn't wait to vote. That was like my favorite thing. I was just like, oh my God, when can I vote? I'm like super excited about it. I'm still like that today. Like I, I, I'm always like, it doesn't matter what the election is. I'm like, I'm super excited to vote every time. Yeah, I think uh, having a mom that came from Jamaica and Jamaica's not only political revolution, but also the level of violence in a way that has come from that country through politics has really taught me that we need to take these things seriously. Right. That our communities and the state of our communities is incredibly important to be engaged in because people experience real strife for these issues, uh, both you know to solve those, to experience those causes and to work against those causes. Um, and I think that Claudette Colvin in this story is another example of that, of taking, you know, understanding an issue, believing in it and taking that step. So how do you think you can you carry that history with you, both as, you know, a black woman that is in a, a white, we know a, a white heteronormative patriarchal publishing industry that we know can be difficult uh, in these spaces? And, and how do you think you challenge uh, and make space even when it's hard? Uh, I think that I have learned, and of course, I have the example of all of those who have come before me, including uh, Ms. Colvin, that you take the chance anyway, you take that shot anyway, 
even if you're scared, even if it seems difficult, even if, um, even if your voice shakes, right? You still do the thing anyway, because if it's the right thing to do, it's the right thing to do. And even if it doesn't work out for you, you've still done the right thing and you still feel good about it. And I am very, very much that person. Um, I am very, very much the person who is going to point out, hey, this isn't right. What can we do about it? But I'm also very um, solution oriented, right? So what um, Claudette did was she, you know, decided to refuse to give up her seat on the bus wasn't necessarily thinking about what the impact of that was going to be, because this was something that happened in a moment, right? She was presented with this moment and she had to respond to it in a particular way. I have not had that same experience where I am presented with a moment. So I have the benefit of being able to sit and think about what might be the impact and think about what might be the best way forward. One of my absolute favorite things to do, even though I'm not a lawyer, is to go to the law and look things up and see what is actually precedent for for certain things. Um, You know, what are the rules? What are the standards? What are the, you know, what have people done before me? And then bring that to the table and say, okay, this is where we are. This is what I can show you um, are the right you know, things to do. And and these are the right paths forward. And I think I have learned that by looking at um, people like Miss Miss Colvin and, um, and seeing that, you know, there was absolutely nothing wrong with saying, you know what, no, this isn't okay. What are we going to do now? You know, here's what I'm going to do. What are you going to do? I feel like you follow a similar logic of my mom, where my mom says, if you don't think the rule is fair, just break it. Don't worry about it. You need to take the moments to be an upstander and to, to always you know, use your voice when you feel it is right. And to also be considerate in that action of how that impacts other people. And that's yeah, a super Caribbean powerful, woman, man, right? <laughs> yes, very, very powerful Caribbean woman, I must say. Uh, but I think my, I guess uh, to get in a little, a, tri- a more silly note of you breaking a rule is that the title starts with because. And that is a rule that most students are told never start with because, don't use because. And I I feel like there is power to that because it will grab a kid's attention on the shelf to say, this, why? Because. So I wanted to know where the title of the idea for the title came from and and the kind of power that you think that title holds for you. So I was also a school teacher and I taught elementary school. And so, of course, this was a rule that I also taught my kids. But The truth is, I never really thought that was a particularly good rule. Like, I taught it because it was the thing that you were supposed to do as a teacher, right? But the fact of the matter is, the purpose of a sentence is to convey information clearly. That's it. It doesn't really matter how you start that sentence. So Mm -hmm. if you start a sentence with because but it conveys information clearly and people understand what you mean, I think it's okay. I have seen plenty of terrible sentences that are convoluted and convey nothing at all that begin with the, which is supposed to be the rules. So again, here we are. If the rule doesn't work, you break it. But you do kind of have to know what the rules are first, right? You, you have to know what the rules are. You have to know why, um, you know, starting a sentence with because is, um, you know, might not be the strongest way to start a sentence. But in this case, and for this particular book, everything happened because of what she did. And so I really wanted that to echo through the entire thing. And so there are places where I use because, and there are places where I use substitutes for because, because I, you know, I didn't want to just (laughs) keep repeating the same word over and over again, but as an artistic choice, it works really well for this particular story. I love it so much. And I think it's important to also always get kids with the idea that like, 
we're going to challenge something. And this is like, this is another way we can think about things that the rules are not always, you know, what they seem. And I, I love to see your elementary school teacher side, uh, side come out because educators are clearly a huge part of the work we do here at Read Across America and with NEA. So as a former teacher and as an author who's, you see both sides of how students engage with learning and how to create, you know, work that helps kids, you know, learn and, and understand their histories. What ideas or advice do you have for teachers who want to think outside the box and spark, you know, interesting and engaging conversations about reading, particularly as reading both for political and digital reasons is starting to, you know, be seen differently in classrooms? The thing that I engage with a lot with readers when I go into classrooms and do school visits and, and, and things like that is that even though some kids may not consider themselves to be readers, particularly, all kids are storytellers. They all have something to say. They all have something to share. Something has happened to them and they want to tell their friends about it. They want to tell their teacher about it. They want to tell somebody a story about something. And I think that's a great place for teachers to start. Teachers can start with kids just telling a story and then having kids write down that story and then seeing how then that story can then be shared because it is written down and somebody else can read it and then have the same story, even though they weren't there for like that first telling of it, right? And then you can talk about how you make the story really exciting because when somebody is telling a story, they're going to be excited about it, especially if it's a story that they really particularly like, and they're going to make different kinds of word choices that they might make if they had written it down. So when I was a classroom teacher, actually, one of the things that I did to kind of help my kids who didn't feel like they could write a story down right away was I would have them just speak the story out and we would record it. And then they would go to um, to writing it down. And that was a great way to get them into it and also a great way to get somebody else to then read the story that they had told. So I think that's, you know, like just appealing to kids natural need to tell you a thing that happened is a really great inroad to getting kids to read stories or even just have them read a story and like absorb that story and then tell somebody else that story. Because then they really know what that story is about if they know that they're just gonna have to like close that little book and like tell the story to somebody else. And they are kind of amazing at it, actually. They like really get into it. And like their retellings, like you can tell like what's like really important to them and what part of the story is like less important to them, but they like super get into it and they're super good at it. I love that tip. I think it's like, I, I just think the best thing about these conversations is how much as authors and as educators, we are starting to believe and value kids' stories. Like, I just feel like uh, at the beginning of my experience, I felt so doubted. I felt so alone. I felt like, you know, being in a space, like trying to be in the space that I was in, felt like it was everyone treating it like it's such a surprise that I might have like a complex thought or idea about the books that I'm reading in schools. And I'm like, I am one of millions of kids that is thinking this right now. And to hear you have, you know, great tips and advice for kids to be able to tell those stories, because one day that story could lead to a book drive. It could lead to a campaign. It could lead to artwork. It could lead to a movie. We don't know. And teacher's role is to sort of open up those possibilities and to give kids the tools, you know, an accompaniment with their caregivers to be able to tell those stories. Um, and I think the, the problem that we're now facing in, in limiting the ability for that to happen, and luckily when I was in like public school, it really wasn't a thing, was the censorship and challenging of books and history in school. I feel really lucky to, you know, be in college now and to be at a private institution where these things are just not simply, they're not up for debate, uh, but they exist in a really serious way in our public classrooms. Um, and what do you make of these efforts? And what do you think that books, you know, how do books play a role in these social justice movements of today? You know, the thing that is really, really um, interesting to me about the publishing industry right now, and especially what kinds of books are coming out in children's literature, in the last just few years, last, you know, even 10 years or so, 
it is kind of spectacular, the kind of literature that's, that's coming out of um, um, children's literature publishing. And it really kind of surprises me that the idea of censoring books is taking so much traction um, and it's being paired with this idea of, you know, books that are older being better written or better literature or, or things like that. When the writing is just getting stronger and stronger, the, um, the, the forms, the structures of stories are just getting more complex and more interesting. So that particular argument that the books are not as good doesn't actually hold because the literature- It never has, and it never well, will. Well, it never has, it's true, but it's yeah. like, it is really particularly egregious right now because the kind of writing that's coming out of children's literature right now is amazing. I am consistently amazed at the writing that, that comes out. And you realize very starkly, and it was always the case, which I know you know, it was always the case that this is about holding down certain groups of people. This is about racism. It's about misogyny. It is about um, anti-LGBTQIA+. Um, it really is just about holding power for people who have had power and who do not want to give up power. That's really what censorship is about. It is about nothing else. It is not about the literature. It is not about the strength of the writing. It is not even about the content of the writing where they keep trying to say it's about the content of the writing. The content of the writing is actually amazing. It is actually stuff that kids want to um, read. And it is actually presented in a way that is really appropriate for the age level. Like these are things that authors and editors are constantly talking about, like, is it appropriate? Is it, um, and, and there are so many experts that we can go to, to talk to about this. Like I have a, I have a degree in education, so I really know like what's appropriate. Um, but I have never come across any book that is coming out for kids that has really inappropriate content. It is, you know, so the argument is specious. It just does not hold. And it really is just about power. And I think that most people do understand that. Um, the, the important thing though, is that we need to push back against it as much as we can every single time. Like don't even give it a single moment, never give it a chance to, to get its little hooks in because the moment it does, then, you know, it, it just becomes a, a, a bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger thing. Um, so we are always pushing against it. And there's so many authors and so many publishers who are really starting to, um, well, not even starting to, who have always been pushing against this so that, you know, people understand that censorship is not okay. It is never okay. It is just, it, it's, it should not be a thing. Like, why are you doing this? You know, the, the idea of freedom means... Freedom means <laughs> being free to have access to things. That is what freedom means. It does not mean it's opposite. I completely agree with you. And I find this moment very difficult in a way that like, this is just not the trajectory I thought we were on. You know, like this is just really not what I thought was going to happen. But it is the everyday investments of people that believe in these stories, that respect and honor history and that believe in my generation and generations to come that, you know, make learning possible, that make storytelling possible. And you are one of those people. So we want to thank you so much for your time. Everybody go out there and make a reading connection with Because Claudette. It is an amazing story that tells us about civil rights narratives that we often don't get to hear and also celebrates Black girls and the power of Black girls. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Marley. Very much, very appreciate it. And I miss you. I haven't seen you in person in such a long time. I know. Uh... <laughs>